nursing and today I'm going to give you a just a brief talk on cancer symptom management from a um, advanced from an advanced nurse practitioner sort of standpoint. So I'd like to frame this discussion today in the within the quality of life domains and you'll understand as we go through a little bit more about this. Um, Quality of life, there is no universal definition for that. It's a subjective self-reported concept. It varies across lifespan and gender. And as you see here, there are four basic domains, quality of life domains, uh, the psychological, spiritual, social, and physical. And what happens in one, as you see here, overlapping can impact the other domains. So it's really important to begin our discussion by symptoms and its management within this context. I want us to be thinking very holistically uh, when we treat for one symptom, how that treatment may impact another quality of life domain or how the pain or a symptom may impact these other domains. So once again, pulling back and thinking holistically. Uh, this is a brief chart that talks about the, just the quality of life domains or the categories and some of the common symptoms that the cancer patient may experience during, within those domains. For example, pain uh, within the physical is, domain. We're very familiar with that pain, perhaps anorexia, nausea, vomiting, uh, mobility, how uh, a symptom may impact uh, mobility, uh, how mobility itself may impact other domains or quality of life domains. Like if you're not mobile, then you are not likely to get outside your home very often, and that therefore limiting your social interaction, therefore impacting your social uh, domain, which may make you depressed and affects your psychological do domain. Or if you can't get out and you're very uh, religious and uh, it's important to go to your church or other religious uh, group or meeting, then you're that could negatively impact that domain. So once again, connecting all of the pieces is really important for us to begin to think. Prevalent symptoms, these are some of the most common symptoms that are associated with cancer. We're only gonna talk about a few of these today to give you an example of how to assess the symptom and some of the more common interventions. Symptom assessment begins with the severity of the symptom. How bad is it? Uh, how uh, is it from one, which doesn't really bother me very much, all the way up to 10, which bothers me quite a bit, very, very, very much. Frequency, how frequent is it? How does it interfere with my activities? Changes, how does it change over time? Is it better, worse, or about the same? Some of the tools that you could use, um, um, I'll, this general, MD Anderson symptom inventory. It's a great sort of general tool. And you can see here, I've given you some uh, links to access that tool and, and other tools also could be found in the National Palliative Care Research Center. All very good tools that you can select from. So I wanted to talk a little bit about pain today and what a comprehensive assessment might look like with that. So pain is at the center here. And once again, focusing on the quality of life domains. So physically, what does pain cause physically besides the pain itself? Well, it can cause nausea, vomiting. You can have some fatigue, uh, decreased strength. Your, as we mentioned earlier, functional mobility, your functional ability may be decreased by the pain level. Once again, I'm beginning to connect the central complaint or uh, report from the patient of pain to perhaps some other associated symptoms within the physical domain. And then we'll say, okay, well, how does that pain impact their psychological domain? Perhaps it causes a lot of fear. Oh my gosh, the cancer is really bad. It's getting worse. It's reoccurred. Uh, um, depression, uh, psychological. And I thought it was all over and now we're back again. Uh, a common issue that really needs to be assessed and addressed early on is 
this, the beliefs about opioids. What does the patient actually, uh, what are their belief systems surrounding opioids? Many patients have a very strong belief system that they don't want opioids, which is critical for us to understand in our treatment plan. They oftentimes will have some major fear of addiction. I don't want to take that because my brother Joe, he got addicted and he's never been the same and it destroyed the family, et cetera, et cetera. Spiritual, oftentimes pain is from a spiritual standpoint uh, can be um, seen as a redemptive suffering, which uh, I'm suffering because of for the world and therefore, you know, I don't want you to treat my pain with pain medications or certain religions and spiritual, spiritual practices frown on taking pain medications. So it's important for us to know that. And from a uh, spiritual standpoint, also I'll bring up that it's important for uh, if the patient has a belief system that has traditional medicines, that that be included in the plan if possible. Pain could certainly impact the social realm by affecting the patient's role. Perhaps they were the head of the household and they are, have held the job and went, went to work daily, carried the insurance for the patient. If you have uh, that type of insurance coverage or if you're a universal, then that may not be of a significant um, importance, but if you are the breadwinner, the primary person that goes out, and all of a sudden you're in so much pain that you cannot do that, then that shifts and perhaps you can't work. And then that causes financial distress, uh, which then causes psychological distress. So I want to begin really to kind of think about connecting all of these uh, dots and within the framework of quality of life. Don't want to leave out the caregiver in any of our assessments as we go through today. What is the caregiver's meaning of pain? They may have a completely different meaning. Uh, they are, their meaning of pain may be completely different than the patient's. They, the caregiver may have a lot of fear of recurrence or uh, feeling bad or guilty that they can't help the patient cope with the pain. Um, so it really is to begin to think about what are the caregivers' fears, worries, concerns, uh, or the meaning of pain? We always want to include them in a holistic patient-centered care plan. One of the ways that we can do uh, sort of formulate our assessment plan is to use this uh, acronym OCART-M, and I've added the M here, uh, and we'll go through that just briefly. This applies to all other types of symptoms you can use as exact. Uh, acronym. So O is for the onset. When did it start? L, location. Where is it? You can oftentimes ask the patient, point to it. Duration. How often is it consistent, intermittent? How long does it last when it comes? Um, you can also use this for breakthrough pain. If you're, uh, as the APN, you're giving some medication or you've uh, given some type of intervention, and you want to see how that intervention well is working and if the patient is having breakthrough pain between whatever your intervention is, particularly if you're using a long-acting pain medicine, uh, 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 opioid, you want to say, okay, well, is the patient having breakthrough? And you can use this exact uh, acronym here. C for characteristics. How the A is for aggravating factors. What factors make the pain worse? Um, movement, position, changing, changing a position, coughing, perhaps bowel movement may make the pain worse. Relieving factors, what makes the pain better? Is a certain position better? Some medications work better than others, heat or cold. T is for treatment. Have you tried anything to manage the pain? What works well for you now or what works works, what has worked for you in the past. So you want to try to incorporate those things that have worked for the patient um, in the past. And M is the meaning of the symptom to the patient. What does that, what does pain mean to them? Because we're getting into the <coughs> psychological, spiritual evaluation by this particular uh, question. Pain management, there are some basic steps here. 
And the first step in the basic assessment is, is the pain related to an oncologic emergency? So how do we know that? Uh, is it a bone fracture? Is it they, that there has been some neural axle metastasis that has caused a spinal cord compression? Is there an infection? Is the tumor perhaps or <clears throat> obstructing, obstructing or perforating? So uh, those are treated as obviously emergency issues that need different types of interventions than uh, some other acute or chronic conditions. So those things may be treated by analgesics. We may have to have surgery, steroids, radiation therapy. So you want to consider what the source is, what are the, what's the driving force behind the pain to determine what uh, intervention needs to take place. If the, the pain is, you've determined that the pain is not related to an oncologic emergency, then what type of pain or mechanism of pain uh, are you dealing with? And this is good to follow the uh, WHO pain ladder and if the patient is opioid naive, then you can use your pain scale that we talked about earlier uh, in the talk from one to 10 to guide your decision about what level of pain intervention medication that you would need, vary, uh, varying from non-opioid to opioid, depending on what the pain level was. Certainly if the pain is between four and seven. You uh, can use short-term opioids, uh, and you may want to use also long-acting opioids if the patient is having to take, you know, four, four to five, three to four is what the uh, who says. But generally, um, if it's more than that, <clears throat> would like to use some long-acting pain medication so you don't have these spikes in the pain level, and you get a nice level control of pain, and then the patient may have small little blips of pain or spikes that can you can use the short-acting pain medication for. Certainly, if the pain is eight or greater, that is not something that you're going to be able to control well as an outpatient, and they may require some in, acute inpatient hospitalization or hospice to get that pain level under control. In addition to these, uh, this pain intervention scale over here by who, you certainly will also want to consider based on the mechanism, they may need surgery to relieve uh, um, a painful uh, obstruction or some other uh, cause of the pain. They may need radiation therapy. If, if the pain is um, generated by the tumor pressing on something that's not emergent, but causing a fair amount of neuropathic uh, type pain, then you could certainly use these. And here are a list of other interventions. Antidepressants and anticonvulsants are oftentimes used uh, for neuropathic type pain, very excellent and controlling that or helping control that. And then steroids obviously can do that as well, decrease inflammation and some of the non sort of uh, medication uh, types of interventions, physical therapy, massage, acupuncture, yoga, uh, cognitive behavioral system. Back to the opioid uh, pain or the who pain ladder. If they are not naive of opioids, then you could use the same scale as well here and just adjusting the long acting and the short acting pain medication to get an optimal pain level. I personally, you can ask the pain, uh, ask the patient what their pain level, uh, what their goal would be for the pain level. Some patients say, oh, well, you know, I want it zero. Well, we know that that's not a realistic expectation. So it gives you an opportunity to kind of talk about pain control and what is possible. Uh, sometimes we do get to a zero, but um, oftentimes, <clears throat> a more realistic goal is four or less, but 
let the patient tell you what they uh, what their pain level is because they may not want to have be so heavily medicated and they may be a pain level of six may be perfectly acceptable to them with the trade-off that they have perhaps more uh, uh, less side effects from the, uh, the uh, pain medication or opioids. And you would generally use a combination of opioids and other types of interventions to treat the pain, depending once again on what the mechanism of the pain is. Symptom of fatigue, we're going to, you can still use the OCAR-M evaluation of there. Um, what, uh, one thing that is really important to ask about fatigue is, uh, is there any sleeping difficulty associated with this? Or if they're feeling discouraged, sad, blue, what we're doing is, we're, number one, we're getting at insomnia can frequently occur in cancer patients and can cause fatigue. If you're not sleeping well, you, you have a lot of fatigue perhaps. Discouraged, sad, blue, we're getting at depression. Does the patient have depression? And if we the depression were treated, then their fatigue would be better. We want to know how well that uh, or how much that symptom interferes with their ability to function, particularly in their social life or their relationship issues. Once again, thinking about work and home responsibilities and how uh, that could impact the patient. 60 to 90 percent of patients that are cancer patients will have some level of fatigue, cancer related fatigue. It has a name and this is what um, is often you'll see referred to in the literature, cancer related fatigue. It is high in those patients that are receiving chemotherapy and uh, radiation therapy is kind of right underneath that. It's underdiagnosed and undertreated. And the etiology is not well understood. There are multiple causes of fatigue that are listed here, and we'll talk a little bit about those on the next slide, but it's important to think outside the box. Not everything is related to the cancer. It may be um, that <clears throat> the patient is on a lot of medications and some of those medications interfere, interact with it, each other, and that those medications are actually the cause of the fatigue. Um, I will tell you that from my experience uh, that and the literature that a lot of patients will not report fatigue without being asked specifically, are you having fatigue? Because oftentimes patients will believe or have this belief system that, um, you know, fatigue is part of it. You, you should be fatigued. And the other aspect of that is that if they are having fatigue and they report that to their provider, then they're afraid that they, the cancer treatment that is life-saving may be stopped or adjusted. So they are uh, oftentimes um, or uh, think they don't have a clear understanding of that. Uh, this is not necessarily uh, part of uh, every cancer experience and there are treatments and that's what I wanted to focus on. Once again, you wanna rule out the multiple causes first and here's a list of those potential problems. Anemia, oftentimes very common with cancer patients for various reasons of bleeding or chemotherapy induced, um, but you want to rule those uh, that out. Um, uh, metabolic hypothyroidism is another common uh, problem or root of the fatigue, diabetes. Oftentimes blood sugar gets a lot of white particular particularly if you're giving the patient steroids to treat a symptom, then their, uh, their glucose may be out of, fact, uh, out of uh, control. So you wanna look at all of these and kind of go through this list and rule these things out with various uh, laboratory or uh, scans so if in the case of a bone mat or uh, laboratory data in ca case of the hypothyroidism, certainly infection. If you have a urinary tract infection or a bloodstream infection, then this can certainly generate fatigue. And let's not forget the sleep disturbance, particularly sleep apnea. A lot of people have sleep apnea that, are, that goes undiagnosed. Depression is another undiagnosed and un, sort of not really thought about in relationship to fatigue. Patients will describe this type of fatigue as something that they have never experienced before. It is profound. It is uh, patients describe to me, I'm just bone tired. 
uh, and they just feel so fatigued and it's not relieved by rest. You know, I used to, when I get fatigued, I would rest a little bit and I'd be energized and I'd go on about my way, but not the case uh, with this type of fatigue. Oftentimes resting, uh, taking frequent naps, that kind of thing makes, actually makes the pain of the uh, fatigue worse. So what we do is treatment. Uh, you can obviously behavioral uh, therapies work well, cognitive retraining and the uh, or reframing of the fatigue can help um, day, regular daily exercise. And this is something that as uh, I would say best, uh, just something like walking. It doesn't have to be anything really aggressive exercise, but walking 15 to 20 minutes a day, every day, whether you want to or not, has been shown to be very effective in managing or helping cancer-related fatigue. And then we have these, uh, the uh, stimulants, um, American ginseng, antidepressants can also be used, and then uh, this, uh, these drugs like Ritalin or other um, uh, stimulants can be used here. Depression is oftentimes a, a misunderstood and um, underdiagnosed. It varies by type of cancer and the place on the cancer continuum the patient is. Perhaps at early in at diagnosis, perhaps patients may uh, oftentimes feel more depressed uh, than further on, but never assume that there isn't depression along the continuum that we talked about earlier. One thing that is oftentimes uh, misunderstood is that when the patient has received their therapy and they are now considered off treatment, and oftentimes it's a big celebration for people. You know, if you're in an infusion therapy, oftentimes they'll have bells and things that you can ring and, oh, congratulations, you're, you finish your treatment. But oftentimes when the patients are really asked, you may see the patient crying during this time. Well, it's not necessarily tears of joy, Oftentimes, it's really a sense, a profound sense of um, depression, fear, anxiety, because you've been watching them as the APN, you've been caring for them, seeing them perhaps every month or maybe even every week during chemotherapy, and then all of a sudden the treatment's over, and you're like, oh, great, you've, you know, you've, you've successfully completed treatment, and I won't see you again now for three months. That's good news where the patient is thinking, oh my gosh, that I remember back tell, them telling me that the cancer could really progress in, in a week. Uh, and, you know, I, I want to stay on top of that. And I'm really scared and I'm, I'm depressed now. So I want you to kind of think that, uh, perhaps see that the patients, as they move through the trajectory, is not, our, our perception as the provider is oftentimes markedly different than what the patient's perception is. So our challenge is always to be in tune with the patient and try to get their perception of what's going on. As I said, it's under misunderstood, underdiagnosed, and undertreated, and it can be devastating on the patient and the families because of withdrawal, uh, if isolation, um, can negatively impact relationships, as you can imagine, between uh, their families, patients' families, and their friends. It's a state of suffering, a sense of sadness and emptiness. And once again, I want you to think about the quality of life domains. If you have depression here in the psychological domain, and we just mentioned some of these isolation things, other things, um, and so, you know, you would be socially isolated. You may be uh, feeling spiritually um, down in the sense that, you know, I, uh, I've lost my connection, my spiritual connection. And physically, you, you're withdrawn. You're not getting much exercise. So then you have muscle wasting, which then circles around. So I really want you to begin to focus really, really, really try hard to integrate these symptoms uh, into these quality of life domains. To, uh, how, what is the assessment? There's a comprehensive depression assessment. Uh, generally, a depression is classified as those uh, people that have uh, two weeks or greater. It's a major depression uh, 
and they would have five or more of these symptoms, as you see here, loss weight, loss, significant loss weight, weight loss, or gain. Sometimes people will um, eat uh, to sort of soothe their depression, so you would uh, might see gain, uh, weight gaining. The T, we talked about the earlier, earlier loss of energy, uh, diminished ability to think or concentrate, uh, indecisiveness, and recurrent thoughts of death and uh, suicide. I want to make sure that I, I pay close attention to this. If a patient has uh, suicidal ideations, then this needs further investigation. And your facility if, uh, should have a suicide um, sort of um, protocols. And if you don't, then you will need to develop one. Presentation, there's depression is often a cluster of symptoms. Anxiety is oftentimes associated with depression, but commonly uh, fatigue, sleep disturbance, pain, and depression, particularly with breast cancer patients, you will uh, oftentimes see insomnia uh, associated with depression and anxiety. So it's generally not just one pure depression. So when thinking about this particular symptom, think about, ask the patient, well, you know, are you having anxiety and depression? Can you quantitate, quantitate that for us? Are you having these other symptoms? Ask, you have to ask the patient. The other symptoms we've kind of talked about over uh, uh, throughout this, social withdrawal is a very common one difficulty in making plans, poor self-care. Um, patients, uh, families have told me, I can't get uh, the patient uh, to bathe. It's been a week or two weeks before they, uh, they've they had a shower and they just, or care, they just don't seem to care about themselves anymore. Once again, you can use the OCART M uh, as your way to assess, but there's also this uh, way to sort of think about it, a sad face. And you can see here, it kind of gives you some ideas to kind of jot down and think, oh, the appetite, S is for sleep, uh, A, uh, loss of interest and pleasure and activities, D, depressed mood, F, fatigue, agitation, concentration. So it just gives you a way to kind of uh, logically think through the diagnosis of depression as the advanced practice nurse. So uh, some assessment tools here are, they're listed here and I've given you a few links to go to those. So you can use some type of assessment tool to monitor the patient over time. So you can see a score of X uh, is better or worse uh, after treatment uh, and it gives you a way to follow the patient uh, over the course. The common uh, management, you have antidepressants that generally the, the ones here, particularly in the States, uh, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors are generally the first line therapy now. Uh, very rarely tricyclic antidepressants, but antidepressants are not just the uh, answer to take a pill without some type of psychotherapeutic intervention. Some cognitive behavioral therapy, some counseling or psychology, uh, other things to augment the medication. Um, so uh, when I prescribe antidepressants, then I also prescribe some counseling or psychotherapy for that patient so they work very nicely together. Other ways to deal with, uh, help with depression, augment uh, your treatment modality here, exercise, relaxation therapy, yoga, music, art therapy, and acupuncture have been some things that have been used. I want to reinforce that the antidepressants, particularly the SSRIs, uh, there are some major concerns with certain types of antidepressants in patient breast cancer patients that are on tamoxifen and ER positive breast cancer patients. If you have a breast cancer patient that's ER positive on tamoxifen, you need to be very, very careful with which antidepressant you use. Avoiding uh, these particular medications here, uh, anything that inhibits the strongly uh, inhibits the CYP2D6. And you can look this up on uh, when you get ready to prescribe an antidepressant. Uh, obviously, you want to look and make sure that you're not making things worse. 
and, and certainly interfering with the cancer treatment. So it's just a mindful uh, processing of when you prescribe a medication uh, to a patient. So you want to uh, be very careful of these uh, particular medications when prescribing tamoxifen or if the patient owns own tamoxifen or ER positive breast cancer. So with that, I will close and I hope you have gained some useful information today. Thank you. Hello everyone, it's Dr. Richard Taylor again from the UAB School of Nursing and I'm gonna give you a brief overview on cancer treatment modalities. We'll begin with surgical treatment or surgical therapy. The types are uh, that you probably will come across as biopsy, resection, access, uh, device implantation, and uh, reconstruction. So these are the types of surgery that you know, most likely uh, you will encounter. Certainly the biopsy uh, is critical uh, to get a tissue diagnosis. Oftentimes when you're resecting, uh, uh, you can uh, also do biopsies, but resection, uh, hopefully debulking as much of the tumor as possible. So that's critically important. And then of course, reconstruction that you're familiar with in the sense that perhaps uh, the, the patient is a breast cancer patient and has had a mastectomy and is now in need of a reconstructive surgery. The goals of this particular therapy is prevention, diagnosis, staging, treatment, reconstruction, and palliative. And I think you're probably familiar with these here and re reconstruction, but and just a, a little bit about palliative surgery is that we know that that is not curative, but we want to remove uh, obstruction or, uh, or tumor that may be pressing on the spinal column or, or uh, causing distension that may cause pain or discomfort or immobility. So there are certainly reasons to do a surgery uh, even if the patient is in palliative care or even in hospice sometimes. So radiation therapy is our next modality and it uses uh, high energy X-rays or, or protons that ionize um, from a linear accelerator. And that's, you see that here in this picture and it disrupts the atoms um, as uh, how, it, uh, dis, how it affects the cell uh, by, by damaging the DNA. So it causes cell destruction by that, uh, in that manner. And cells that are, are in more rapid mitosis are much more radiosensitive than those that are not. So mostly uh, cancer cells are uh, rapidly dividing cells. And so that's uh, one reason that radiation therapy is effective. The goal of radiation therapy is to eradicate or decrease the size of the tumor or the cancer. Oftentimes um, it is used uh, before another treatment, a neoadjuvant, um, and uh, then uh, the other treatment is given, perhaps surgery or uh, chemotherapy. And it's to improve the survival and the quality of life of the patient. The delivery system, uh, external beam, radio uh, brachial therapy, a radio isotope stereotactic radio surgery. And um, the uh, part of this radiation therapy is the radiation therapy planning, which uh, the which uses various modalities uh, such as CT scans or MRI scans that will map the tumor and then the radiation physicist goes in and calculates how much radiation should be given uh, to the area, outlines the area as you see here in this diagram of a person that has a brain tumor. You can see that there are different levels of radiation and given the hottest or the most intense radiation is given to that um, person, this, this center part here, and then it decreases in the strength of the radiation or the intensity of the radiation as you go out from the core of the radiation, uh, or core of the tumor, I'm sorry, 
you are always wanting to preserve as much tissue as possible, good tissue. Uh, that's why uh, there are decreasing levels of radiation. So that's um, how this looks. And it's, this is very much uh, how it looks in, when they map the tumor. As I had mentioned earlier, radiation has different roles. It can be a definitive standalone treatment, uh, neoadjuvant before any other uh, chemotherapy or surgery uh, is uh, performed, oftentimes with the goal of debulking or shrinking the tumor down to its smallest size. An adjuvant uh, given along with uh, a treatment like radiation, uh, I'm sorry, chemotherapy may be given along with radiation. And then as we mentioned earlier, a prophylactic or uh, certainly palliative, just as the surgery talked about earlier, can be a palliative radiation therapy can shrink the tumor. Let's say the patient has a spinal met and the met is causing spinal cord compression. This is an oncologic emergency, as we mentioned, uh, as I mentioned in my other video. And you want to emergently decrease the bulk of that tumor to release the spinal cord and manage the symptoms better. Another very familiar treatment about modality as chemotherapy, and it's used to prevent cancer cells from multiplying, invading, or metastasizing. And how it works is it disrupts or destroys uh, a particular phase of the cell cycle of the cancer cell. The goals are cure or remission control or palliation. And these will be consistent throughout for all of the cancer treatments. Um, hopefully, you know, the goal would be cure, but in some situations that's not possible. And it's just a mitigation of the side effects or symptoms associated with the, uh, the cancer. Types, there are as we, just as with the radiation, it could be primary, we're only gonna give chemotherapy and this is a primary treatment, or we can give adjuvant along with an, the radiation or another treatment, uh, neoadjuvant before, and then chemo prevention. Classification of the chemotherapeutic agents are based on what a phase of the cell cycle they disrupt or destroy. And you can see those listed here. Uh, alkylating neuro uh, nitros, uh, and plant alkaloids, et cetera. So uh, various agents. And once again, it's their side effects are specific to the class. So if you know the class uh, of agent that the chemotherapy falls into, then you can certainly know uh, the side effects. What I do want to re remind you is that chemotherapy is a biohazard chemical and should be handled with such. Here in the United States, only nurses that are specially trained in chemotherapy administration uh, requiring a certificate can give chemotherapy. And as an advanced practice nurse, uh, also, special requirements here in the United States are required to uh, order that particular medication. The next treatment is immunotherapy or biotherapy, and uh, it's really to stimulate the body's immune system to fight cancer uh, through um, the stimulation of the natural killer cells, T cells, B cells, all those uh, cell lines that help the immune system. And so it's to help the cancer cell to be seen as a uh, dangerous invader, and then the natural immune system will take over. So IL-2, the interleukin-2 is um, effective because it has the ability to upregulate proliferation and differentiation of natural killer cells and T lymphocytes. It also works as a cofactor for activation of macrophages and B cells. There's no really direct effect on the tumor cells, but it provides the same, IL-2 provides sustained upregulation of the immune system, eliciting this anti-tumor response uh, by the immune cells and other cytokines. The interferons, 
they are part of a larger family of uh, immune uh, immunoregulators, uh, proteins, uh, and they, uh, after binding the, the interferon it, to a cancer cell, it affects, it, it generates an effect by suppressing the cell's proliferation and induces cell death, and it can inhibit angiogenesis. It also increases the immune response to uh, the tumor cells. Uh, through also upregulation of the natural killer cells, macrophages, T and B cells. The cancer vaccines, they um, vaccinate against malignancies with a natural history that's directly related to infection, such as perhaps hepatitis B can cause liver cancer, uh, human papillovirus can cause cervical cancer. So by immunizing or a vaccine, vaccinating against those uh, particular infectious agents, then uh, the cancer uh, hopefully will be um, uh, mitigated. Cancer uh, incidents could be mitigated. All right. So another therapy is targeted therapy. It's agents that interfere with specific extracellular and intracellular targets that in, interrupt the signal pathways that affect proliferation, regulation, angiogenesis, and apoptosis. So um, this enables um, a very precise destruction of cancer cells. It's, uh, as I said, designed to interfere with, with uh, dysfunctional signaling that cancer cells have. Uh, to stop the cancer growth. Uh, they bind uh, to the receptor on the surface of the cancer cell and they serve as sort of a switch that is flipped to regulate the growth and control the development of cancer. Angiogenesis, and these are some of the factors that we'll talk just briefly about today. The um, Factor, <clears throat> excuse me, the vascular endothelial growth factor, it affects the angiogenesis pathway. And angiogenesis is responsible for maintenance of the vascular system that controls delivery of oxygen and nutrients and elimination of metabolic waste uh, in our, our, our normal uh, tissue, right? Uh, it brings the necessary oxygen and nutrients uh, to the area for growth. Uh, and uh, maintenance of the tissue uh, by the vasculature. Now, what's different is this tumor angiogenesis. Now, this involves development of blood vessels that are structurally and functionally abnormal. They're different than our regular, our normal uh, angiogenesis process that keeps uh, supply to our uh, body. Um, the vessels are very irregular, they're distended, they, are, they have leaky walls uh, and have sluggish blood flow. So the, the growth of the tumor is dependent on its vascular supply, right? So when the tumor can no longer um, obtain adequate supply of oxygen and nutrients, its intercellular environment secretes increased amounts of this veg F here and uh, this and to the surrounding tissues of where the tumor is located. And what it does is it really um, down regulates the proteins that inhibit angiogenesis. And by doing so, it flips another what's called angiogenic switch. And what that then happens is that we have um, Ves, increased ves, vessel formation that, for lack of a better word, sort of uh, feed the tumor, allow the tumor. As you see here in this picture, the, uh, this is what the tumor looks like. And then what the blood vessels are feeding or are supplying the nutrients and oxygen to the tumor. And an anti-VEGF factor would be to decrease this. So you see that it's not allowing the secretion of this particular uh, substance that would uh, 
uh, increase the blood vessel or formation. So the goal would be just to sort of um, cut off the or decrease the blood supply and the oxygen uh, nutrients uh, to the tumor cell. So hopefully uh, cancer death would occur in that way. And then if you were to relapse, this is what it will look like it did when it began. Okay. Hormonal, it's a mechanism of action is uh, poorly understood, but it's a critical component in the treatment of many different cancers, breast cancer, prostate cancer, uh, particularly. And you see here the major classes, uh, corticosteroids, and androgens, estrogens, and estrogen, androgen blockers. And the mechanism is, as I said, poorly understood, but it blocks the receptors on the cell surface, which prevent the cell from uh, receiving uh, normal hormonal growth stimulation. So it decreases the, the growth of the tumor. And examples of this would be tamoxifen or um, other similar um, drugs. So this is an example here. Uh, this is just an example of a breast cancer patient. So oftentimes uh, you will get one of these uh, blockers, uh, these hormonal therapies. And one of the most common issues that I see in my practice with this particular agent is hot flashes, um, very severe hot flashes, maybe 10 to 12 hot flashes a day that are oftentimes people will be drenched in sweat and it's very uncomfortable and it's hard to work in an environment like that. We go back to our, concept, our conceptual model of the quality of life uh, domains and Obviously, if you are trying to continue to work and you're sitting there talking to someone and you're sweating profusely and you are flushed and it really impacts your ability to work effectively. And, and so that's just one example of it affecting a quality of life domain that perhaps let's say that you have to quit work and then you're financially, you're, you don't have the financial resources and perhaps you even lose your insurance coverage here in the United States for those that have insurance that are provided by their employers. So hot flashes and arthralgias are another huge issue. Um, arthralgias in addition to the hot flashes are a big deal and should always be assessed. Um, most of the time patients will report that, but you really need to ask them specifically. And then there are treatments for these hot, uh, hot flashes and arthralgias. Prostate cancer is another um, cancer that hormonal therapy is frequently used in. And once again, you get uh, hot flashes associated with this. They're oftentimes suppressing the testosterone level to, to non-existent and, and hot flashes in men are very distressing and very common with this particular treatment modality. They have also decreased libido and oftentimes erectile dysfunction, which uh, can be quite distressing. Um, some of the complementary and alternative therapies uh, that uh, I'm just going to briefly go over here. Um, energy therapies such as uh, a manipulation of the energy fields, um, exercise therapies, Tai Chi uh, is one of those. Um, mm, one of the mind body interventions, and this is uh, really focused on the fact the belief system that the mind and the body is strongly connected. And so working on that connection oftentimes can certainly help with symptoms for sure. Now, whether it has a major impact on cancer itself is, uh, is another issue, but certainly I use it frequently for patients that have symptoms. There are, uh, complex um, natural products, uh, supplements, et cetera, that oftentimes are used 
And this is really just a good point of time for me to make sure that you understand that uh, and should ask the patient if they're taking any complementary medicines, particularly herbal medicines or uh, homeopathic medicines. Uh, some, as we mentioned earlier, in the quality of life domains, spiritually, there could be some interventions that were uh, used from a cultural standpoint that would be really important to try to incorporate into your practice and give that uh, give the patient some uh, opportunity uh, to participate in their care. But you have to be careful with many of these products because they do impact other medications, particularly cancer therapies that might be contraindicated. So that's just a uh, quick uh, overview. So thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. Hi, I'm Carrie Hyde, and I am an oncology certified nurse practitioner at UAB Hospital in Birmingham, Alabama. Well, I'm specifically working with our infusion therapy population for patients coming in for treatment. Um, I did not get into the oncology role as a typical path, um, as you might think, but I had my aunt who was one of the original people who opened our bone marrow transplant intensive care unit at UAB, and I had heard her stories about oncology patients for many years. So I was very interested in the subject, but when I first got out of school, it was a little mentally and emotionally challenging for a new graduate, so it took me a while to kind of build up the ability to, to feel like I could really work with this patient population. And so after about five years of experience in graduating nurse practitioner school, I had the opportunity to become an infusion nurse practitioner in hematology and oncology. And I have really enjoyed every minute since then. Um, some of my primary roles have been to um, evaluate lab work for patients and see any complaints that they might come in with the day of their treatment to evaluate if they're able to proceed with treatment for the day or not. And so that can range anywhere from very simple uh, complaints that are not related to their therapy really at all or very serious complaints where we're going to the emergency room immediately or admitting the patient and that kind of thing. So I always say that it's kind of like an urgent care within the world of hematology and oncology. So primarily in my role as an infusion nurse practitioner, I very frequently am reviewing abnormal lab work that patients come in with. Um, we check labs prior to every infusion that we do, and so if they have some abnormal lab work, it's my responsibility to review that and make sure that they are able to proceed with treatment for the day. Um, sometimes those uh, labs may hold up treatment and we may have to delay and recheck the labs again in a week. A very good example of that is I very frequently have patients who have neutropenia or thrombocytopenia and we have thresholds that we have to meet in order to proceed with treatment. And there's a lot of critical thinking involved in making those decisions because sometimes we're able to proceed, sometimes we have to hold, like I said before, or sometimes you just do a dose reduction and proceed with treatment at a lower dose. Um, and then you have to consider each patient individually because some patients have chronic neutropenia or thrombocytopenia, so you may proceed with treatment for that patient just because that's their norm, even if it's below your normal threshold. If I had one thing to say to a new oncology nurse practitioner, it would be don't get discouraged. This is a very specialized role. It's a lot of terminology um, that is very unfamiliar to you if you're new to the oncology profession. And it's like learning a foreign language. Um, it takes several months if you're not familiar with this specialty to really feel comfortable and not even um, just not even like you know everything by any means, but just really feeling comfortable and confident that you're taking good care of your patients just takes a long time. So just know that that's very normal for everyone and um, don't get discouraged. Always be learning. Oncology is always changing and so you have to be ready to learn for the rest of your life in this profession. 
we'll discuss some of the secondary effects of cancer treatment and the advanced practice nurse role in caring for patients who are experiencing these secondary effects. We have discussed some of the more common cancer-related symptoms, and now we'll move from that discussion and the management of those symptoms to the management of some of the more common side effects from the perspective of the advanced practice nurse. You can see on this slide, there are some of the most common um, secondary effects of cancer treatment listed here. And about um, 60 to 80% of patients being treated with cancer will experience the first one listed here, chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. This symptom is usually dependent on the type of chemotherapy given and the dosing of that chemotherapy. Preventative treatment with prophylactic medications should be included in chemotherapy regimens that are known to have um, high emetic risk or even intermediate emetic risk. If the chemotherapy regimen is a multi-day regimen, uh, antiemetics should be included daily, taking into consideration the pharmacokinetics of the drugs being used. Combination antiemetic regimens are often the best choice for prophylactic treatment, particularly with IV chemotherapy. If the patient experiences breakthrough nausea and vomiting, then a drug from a different class should be used for treatment of the acute nausea. Non-pharmacologic treatment options should also be considered and should be, uh, the patient should be educated on these options. And these can include anything from eating small frequent meals to avoiding greasy and spicy foods, avoiding caffeine, avoiding strong odors, um, and depending on patient preference, room temperature food or cold options uh, may be best. And of course, staying hydrated with water is very important. Um, regarding mucositis, about 40% of the patients treated with chemotherapy will develop mucositis. Uh, this percentage rises to about 90% for head and neck cancer patients treated with both chemo and radiotherapy. 19% of the latter will be hospitalized and will experience a delay in therapy um, for high-grade mucositis management, resulting in a reduction of the quality of life, um, a worse prognosis, and an increase in patient management costs. Um, and so it's important to consider that in this symptom and, and the other symptoms as well. Regarding diarrhea, um, chemotherapy-induced diarrhea, it is estimated that 50 to 80% of patients will develop chemotherapy-induced diarrhea, with 30% of patients developing a grade three um, diarrhea using the common terminology criteria for adverse events, which we'll go into more a little bit later. Diarrhea, like many of the other symptoms, can lead to dehydration and even require an inpatient admission like some of the other symptoms as well. Um, in this case, it would be for IV fluids and electrolyte repletion if it is severe enough. Regarding um, chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, uh, in a systematic analysis, uh, this symptom, the prevalence of this symptom was about 68% when measured in the first month after chemotherapy. 60% at three months and 30% at six months or more. Different chemotherapy drugs were associated with differences in uh, chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy prevalence. And there is no effective prevention strategy for this. And of course this symptom can lead to dose reduction or stopping therapy altogether. Regarding cytopenias, um, cytopenias are low cell counts due to chemotherapy. Um, this can be anemia, thrombocytopenia, or neutropenia, and depending on which, um, it depends on which cell line is impacted as to um, what low counts the patient may experience. And of course, these can lead to significant um, secondary effects. Um, for example, when platelets are low, the patient is at higher risk for bleeding. Regarding radiation, um, the side effects of radiotherapy in normal tissue can be divided into early or acute and late responses, depending mostly on tissue turnover time and their modulation by processes that mimic a wound healing response. So early or acute side effects occur during, during immediately after or soon after radiotherapy treatment. Early side effects are often reversible when the dose is limited and tissue turnover is high, such as in the oral mucosa, the gut, or partly reversible, such as in the lungs with pneumonitis. 
Late normal tissue side effects are defined by their occurrence several months to even years after radiotherapy. Late side effects are in general chronic and often progressive, leading to a reduction in patient's quality of life following treatment. The advanced nurse practitioner, nurse practitioner uh, plays an important role in the care of the oncology patient when it comes to side effects and complications of treatment. Many times, the advanced practice nurse is the provider that patients will see if they're being worked into the clinic schedule for a sick visit. The advanced practice nurse also often handles uh, patient communication, such as phone calls, voice messages, or electronic communication through the health portal when one is available. Um, and this is often prompted by the patient, this type of communication, when they need to contact the um, provider team about a complication they may be having um, during their therapy. So being familiar with the tools to manage these issues um, is important in the advanced practice uh, nurse role. From taking the history to performing the exam and ordering any necessary diagnostics, as well as making the diagnosis and creating the management plan, the advanced practice nurse role in oncology is often one where management of side effects plays an important role. Um, often in the US, the oncologist will lead the team in planning the overall treatment approach, and the advanced practice nurse will address problems that may come up along the way. The advanced practice nurse also plays a large part in coordination of care, often communicating with other providers who see the patient so that everyone is on the same page when it comes to the care of the patient. Part of the APN's role in managing treatment associated side effects is to be familiar with the available grading criteria and guidelines to help guide our decision making. Here in the US, we rely on several different criteria and guidelines developed by many different organizations. You may have something similar in your country. Here in the US, we use guidelines developed by agencies like the ONS, um, the Oncology Nursing Society, as well as the NCCN or National Comprehensive Cancer Center Network. This organization is critical in developing uh, treatment and management guidelines in the United States. We also use ASCO guidelines or the American Society of Clinical Oncology. There are some internationally known organizations as well, um, including the Multinational Association of Supportive Care in Cancer, also known as MASC. Um, this is certainly a well-known international resource. And of course, the World Health Organization um, has their own grading criteria for many of these symptoms. The CTCAE or uh, Common Terminology Criteria for Adverse Events um, is a tool that was developed in the U.S. but is commonly used internationally as well. So we're going to use a case study here to discuss the concepts behind addressing secondary effects such as chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. Let's walk through how this patient would be evaluated and treated. So this is Ruth Smith. She's a 55-year-old female with breast cancer undergoing treatment with paclitaxel, followed by adriamycin and cytoxin. She's currently in cycle one and presents to the clinic with uncontrolled nausea and vomiting for three days. The first thing to do, of course, is to take a history from this patient. It's important to know when her last cancer treatment was and when her next treatment is expected. This will give us a reference for how much exposure she's had to chemotherapy or radiation if she's been treated with that. As far as the details of the nausea and vomiting, we want to know the onset of the nausea and vomiting. How much has it impacted her daily life? Is she able to eat and drink at all and keep it down? It's also important, of course, to know what she has already tried for her nausea and vomiting that has helped or not helped her feel better. If she has tried something at home and it hasn't helped, we wouldn't want to prescribe this for her now, of course. In a patient with nausea and vomiting who is taking a chemotherapy, we can probably safely assume that the nausea and vomiting is linked to the chemotherapy, particularly if the chemo is highly emetogenic. But as providers, it's important that we rule out other potential causes such as food poisoning or possibly a GI infection. So we would want to certainly ask about other associated signs and symptoms that could help us narrow our differential diagnosis. 
We would want to know the rest of her medical history, of course, so as to avoid drug interactions, and we can therefore safely prescribe uh, medications to her that would not exacerbate any of her other potential conditions. In this case, Ruth Smith is an otherwise healthy patient and has really not experienced any issues with her chemotherapy to this point other than fatigue and some nausea in her first cycle. Our next objective is to ensure that we have her vital signs and then perform our physical exam. In a patient experiencing nausea and vomiting, we would want to review the vital signs for evidence of hypovolemia, like tachycardia or hypotension, as well as recent weight loss. We'd want to make sure to assess for certain indicators of dehydration in our physical exam. So we would assess for things like uh, sensations of thirst, um, weight loss, as already mentioned, dry mucous membranes, sunken eyes, decreased skin turgor, hypotension, tachycardia, flat neck veins, or oliguria. We can then begin to think about what type of nausea and vomiting she's having and which assessment tool we would like to use to help guide our decision making. Here are two examples of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting grading tools. The CTCAE grading stages and tool last updated in 2017, we're on version five now, and then the mask anti-emesis tool are both available here, and you can see these on the screen. Uh, chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting are generally evaluated according to the CTCAE uh, tool. The Multinational Association for Supportive Care in Cancer, or MASC uh, tool um, organization, developed the MASC anti-emesis tool, also known as the MAT, M-A-T, to facilitate the recognition of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting as well, but is really geared towards uh, more towards the evaluation of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting during treatment and not really for acute episodes. So we would want to keep these valuable tools in mind when evaluating our patient. So we're sure to gather all of the information needed to risk stratify her symptoms. In this case, Ruth Smith would have a grade two uh, chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting using the CTCAE tool. With grade two nausea and vomiting, we can generally plan to treat as an outpatient. It's important to know what the patient's treatment regimen um, is so you can understand the emetogenic potential of the regimen. Here are examples of the NCCN treatment guidelines for chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting based on the emetogenic potential of the treatment in the top left corner of the slide here. Underneath that, you can see the NCCN guidelines that describe treatment for acute and delayed nausea and vomiting for high emetic risk drugs. In our patient's case, she is receiving adriamycin and cytoxin, two highly emetogenic drugs, especially when given in combination. To the right um, of the slide in the colorful boxes, you can see examples of the MASK guidelines that detail what types of antiemetics should be considered for a patient who's being treated with a highly emetogenic regimen. So here are two examples of treatment guidelines and they're very similar. In the lower right-hand corner box, you can see recommendations for treatment of delayed nausea and vomiting. By including prophylactic antiemetics in highly emetogenic regimens, most nausea and vomiting can be avoided. But we need to know, like I said earlier, what the patient has taken so that we can decide what approach to use next or how to change prophylactic dosing with the next cycle of chemotherapy in order to avoid this from happening again. So again, it's important to know what the guidelines are suggesting as well as what the patient is actually taking as sometimes these may not match up and for various reasons. It's important that once a patient has breakthrough nausea and vomiting like our patient's having, meaning they received prophylactic antiemetics and are still having nausea and vomiting, that the advanced practice nurse choose an antiemetic from a different class of medications to treat the patient for this nausea and vomiting. So it's again important that once a patient has breakthrough nausea and vomiting, um, that we treat them with a medication from a different class. So here are some um, points here that point towards how to manage breakthrough chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. 
There are other several, uh, several other considerations that we can make to better treat the nausea and vomiting as well, including scheduling around the clock antiemetics instead of using them as needed, um, considering different routes for antiemetics, considering dose adjustments of the anti-cancer drug that the patient is on. And you may also want to consider adding an H2 receptor antagonist or a PPI uh, for patients with dyspepsia and consider changing the prophylactic regimen um, prior to the next cycle in order to try to avoid this breakthrough nausea and vomiting again. So when it comes to managing secondary effects of cancer treatment, we want to be sure to perform thorough evaluations of the patient. This will be our most important guide to determine our next steps. We should also employ the use of available grading criteria, which will help guide treatment and disposition, and then employ the use of treatment guidelines as well. Grading tools and treatment guidelines are available from many different reputable sources and should play a large role in how we take care of our patients, so we are ensuring that the standard of care is followed. I'm Elle Lazar. I'm an advanced practice nurse in an outpatient setting at UAB. It's an academic medical center, and we see a lot of solid tumor and malignant hematology patients. Well, I'm an advanced practice nurse, so that means I get to work closely with physicians and help diagnose patients and help them understand their new diagnosis and the treatment plans and just different options, whether they want to pursue treatment or if they just kind of want to do quality of life issues. So it's just kind of walking patients through all the next steps. I became an advanced practice nurse after I'd been a nurse on a medical floor, specifically hematology floor, for about four years. And when I did that, it kind of helped me understand like the diagnosis of the patient, kind of the treatment that we did. And it made me kind of want to get, gain more, inf more information and knowledge about how to treat these patients better and know like what their survival was and how to help walk them through treatment options. So um, after about four and a half years of uh, being on the floor, I went back to get my um, advanced practice nursing degree. And now I've been an advanced practice nurse for about six years. I now work in the outpatient setting um, and we see both solid tumor and malignant heme and I focus more on malignant heme but sometimes we see solid tumors as well because sometimes we're just trying to help with symptom management. You know these patients are sick and need to be seen acutely and we don't want them necessarily go into the primary care. We, we assist the physicians and collaborate with them to try and help determine if they're dehydrated. Do they need um, to be admitted? You know, can we help with their nausea and vomiting? You know, how do you help them um, manage some of these symptoms from the treatment that we've given them? So one piece of advice that I would give a new advanced practice nurse is just to really listen to your patient. Um, they are going to give you so much information um, and just really take time to listen to them. You know, sometimes um, it seems like there's a lot, of, a lot of symptoms and things that you're trying to understand, but they're going to help you understand the severity. They'll help you sometimes fill in the full picture of that. Um, and even the caregivers are really important too because sometimes the patient doesn't articulate um, what's really going on. But just really taking time to listen to that patient and that helps drive your work up and figure out um, next steps. Like, is, are, is the caregiver concerned or are they just thinking it's kind of a, just a slight change? So just really taking time to listen to your patient and then you can, and if you don't know what to do, there's, you know, sometimes you'll reach out to a physician to help you. Um, but when you really listen to them too, it also helps convey that you're willing to listen to them and the patient, you gain that trust with them. And that's key because when you're going through some of these um, hard diagnoses, telling somebody that they've got cancer, um, they need to know that you're there with them and going to help help them fight and help them um, try and get better. And so if they trust you, it makes it so much easier sometimes when you're having to deliver bad news or having to tell them about complications. As an advanced practice nurse, um, I work closely with other, other disciplines and other um, healthcare professionals um, because our patients are typically pretty complicated. They, um, you know, have a lot of things going on and so it's really essential just to be able to work with di different disciplines with their um, all their expertise so um, like specifically in my practice we work with a lot of um, cardiologists we've got one cardiolo cardiologist that is um, oncology cardiology and she just helps us manage symptoms like if the patient has um, 
fluid on their lungs or fluid around their heart? Um, do, how, do we, should, how much workup do we need to do? Um, she will recommend sometimes do we need to consider a dose reduction. Um, another discipline that we work closely with is um, our supportive care clinic and that their goal is to help with quality of life. So they help us with pain issues. Um, they offer counseling because a new diagnosis of cancer um, has a lot of emotional impact and how do you help them um, emotionally so that they can get better physically. Um, they also help us with, they do sometimes, sometimes they'll do massage, sometimes um, they, that we have a nutritionist too, making sure they're getting enough food in. Um, so I work with them. Um, another thing that we, another discipline sometimes that we work with, I mean, is nephrology, urology, you know, all these different complications that come up. And so sometimes it might be a quick um, consult. You might just pick up the phone and just say, I've kind of got this going on. What would you recommend? Sometimes it's a formal consult where we actually refer them to be seen in that clinic. Um, sometimes it's communicating through the electronic medical record um, so that they have that medical record number and they can look up um, all their past scans, all their labs, and recommend like wh whether we can do treatment outpatient or do we need to admit them for more acute management. Um, sometimes we, um, it's just sometimes it's just collaborating with my physician that is working alongside me in clinic um, because they, they are a wealth of knowledge too.